welcome back to the channel. Today's Scareful story involves eight men, one who was found dead in a vat of wood pulp, one who investigated that man's death, and six who were convicted of conspiracy to commit murder. If you're new here, thanks for watching, and I hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. We are so close to hitting a thousand subscribers. Sorry if you hear a cat in the background. She doesn't want to leave. In the last careful story, we found ourselves in beautiful Door County, Wisconsin. Today, we're a little south in the city of Green Bay, Wisconsin, and in a not-so-pretty paper mill. On November 21st, 1992, 35-year-old Tom Monfiles went to his job at the James River paper mill and never came home. A search ensued, and later the next day, on November 22nd, 1992, Tom Monfiles' body was found in a vat of wood pulp. The sides of the vat were about chest high, and it was filled with a slurry-like liquid of wood pulp. At the bottom of the vat was a propeller, which helped to stir the wood pulp to break it down. Was this a workplace accident, and had Tom accidentally fallen into the vat? Everyone had their answer pretty quickly when they saw a heavy weight tied around his neck. This was no accident. An autopsy showed that Monfiles had sustained a skull fracture prior to his death, and horrifyingly, that he was still alive when he went into the vat. Police began investigating Tom Monfile's death as a murder. It didn't take long for the Green Bay Police to focus their attention on Keith Kutzka, a co-worker of Monfile's. Why they honed in on Kutzka so quickly is a scareful story all in itself. In an awful twist, it was because the Green Bay Police had given Kutzka a motive to kill Monfile. To understand what happened, we need to go back to 11 days before the murder. On the evening of November 10th, 1992, Tom Monfiles became aware that Keith Kutzka was planning on stealing an electrical cord from the paper mill. He called the police department to report the theft. In that call, he asked to remain anonymous because he said that Kutzka was known to be violent. The police didn't write up a report or send an officer to the plant, instead choosing to call the plant and report the theft to them. Security stopped Kutzka on his way out after his shift, and telling him about the report of a theft, they asked to search his bag. When he refused, he was suspended from work for five days. And how do you think he spent that five days? If you answered repenting for stealing, you'd be wrong. If you said that he spent that five days planning out how he would exact revenge on the person who ratted him out, you would win a prize. The first part of that plan was figuring out who had ratted him out. After Kutzka was suspended, Monfiles started getting worried that Kutzka would try and figure out who reported the theft, so he called the police and told them again that he feared what would happen if Kutzka found out. In that call, he said Kutzka was crazy and a biker type, and he asked for reassurance that any recording of the original call he made would never be released to anyone. Monfiles was assured that there was no way in hell the recording would be released. Unfortunately, when it came to the police, the right hand didn't seem to know what the left hand was doing. On November 17th, Kutzka called the police, saying that he was trying to figure out who had reported the theft. By this time, Kutzka was back at work following his suspension, and he made it known to all of his co-workers that he was determined to find out who had gotten him in trouble. Can you imagine being Tom Monfiles and hearing Kutzka talking about how he was going to figure out who had called the police? You'd be worried and scared and probably rethinking having made the call in the first place. We know Monfiles was scared because that same day he calls the police again and this time he asked to talk to the highest guy up. He told the lieutenant he was transferred to that he knew Kutzka was trying to get a copy of the call and that if that happened, Kutzka would easily be able to recognize his voice. He went on to tell the lieutenant that he was really afraid that if that happened, Kutzka might kill him. Monfiles was told to talk to somebody in the communications section. Like, are you kidding me? Instead of dealing with this himself and taking Monfile's fears seriously, the lieutenant puts it on Monfile's to make yet another phone call and hope no one released the recording in the meantime. The next day, Monfile's followed up and did call the communications department. He spoke to the person who normally got all the requests for recordings of calls. Monfile's was assured that the tape would not be released. The day after that, on November 19th, Kutzka called the police again asking for a copy of the recording. The officer he spoke with found the recording and listened to it. He consulted another 
another police department employee, as well as an assistant city attorney, checking to see if it was okay to release the recording. When asked if anyone had promised Monfiles the call would remain anonymous, the officer said no, as he had only listened to the very first call and had no idea of the numerous other calls made by Monfiles to the department, pretty much begging them to not release the recording. Kutzka was told that if he came to the department with $5 and a blank cassette tape, that a copy would be made for him. Delighted by the news, Kutzka told everyone at work that he planned on picking up the tape on his way home. Among the people he told was Tom Monfiles. If Monfiles was already scared, you have to figure that at this point he was in a panic. He called the department yet again, and yet again he was told there was no way that the tape would be released. Sensing that maybe he couldn't rely on the police department's promises, he went a step further and called the Brown County District Attorney's Office. An assistant district attorney told him that under Wisconsin open records laws, that there would be grounds for the police to refuse to release the recording. And he, unlike basically everyone else up until this point, actually followed up and called the police department and told them not to release the tape. The person the assistant district attorney spoke with said the tape would not be released. The next day, November 21st, Tom Monfiles went to work thinking he was in the clear, while Keith Kutzka went to work with a copy of the tape he had picked up from the police department and knowing it was Tom Monfiles' voice on the recording. Monfiles would soon be dead. In case you're wondering, Monfiles' wife did end up suing the Green Bay Police Department, claiming that they bore some responsibility for her husband's death. A jury agreed and awarded her and their children over $2 million. That award was later reduced by an appellate court, but thankfully, they still received some compensation for this massive screw-up. Not that that makes up for losing your husband or father, but I guess it's a little something to know that other people agreed that the police really messed this one up. Back to the investigation of the murder. So that the police immediately suspected Kutska isn't surprising. What is surprising is that the investigation into Tom Monfile's murder quickly stalled. Although police had a theory that Kutzka, along with others, had confronted Monfiles about the call to the police, and that confrontation led to Monfiles ultimately ending up in a vat full of wood pulp, they were having a hard time getting solid evidence to prove their theory. Some would argue that police were having a hard time because Monfiles wasn't murdered, but more on that a bit later. The investigation started picking up speed in 1994 when Detective Randy Winkler became the lead detective on the case. He strongly believed in the theory that Kutzka played the tape to his co-workers, riling them up, and that led to Monfiles being beaten and then dumped into the vat. Kutzka admitted to playing the tapes, but he says there was no confrontation. He claims even to this day that he merely wanted his co-workers to shun Monfiles, not kill him. Investigators had found no real physical evidence Evidence tying anyone to the crime. There was no blood found at the mill or any injuries on any of Monfile's co-workers, and after spending hours in the vat of wood pulp, Monfile's body didn't provide much forensic evidence. Winkler, therefore, had to focus on collecting enough circumstantial evidence to build a case against Kutzka and any other people determined to be involved. He began aggressively interviewing people, and like lots of people, over 500 different interviews, and some would say he interviewed them too aggressively. For almost two years, people had remained largely silent about what, if anything, they'd seen that day at the mill, and according to police, there had to have been some witnesses. The area at the mill where investigators say the fight occurred would have meant others had to have seen what was happening, and yet no witnesses came forward. Investigators say that there were silent witnesses, workers who were afraid to come forward because they feared they would be murdered or that they would be accused of participating. And when you think about it, of course you would be scared to talk to the police. I think that's true of all witnesses to a murder, especially where the suspects are out free. But in this case, Monfiles had reported Kutzka stealing to the police and was promised that his identity would be kept secret, and look how that turned out. 
any witnesses would rightly not trust that investigators could keep them safe. As Winkler investigated and interviewed people, he heard second or even third-hand accounts of confessions. A friend of one of the mill workers told another friend that a man involved in the murder had told him that six workers had beat Monfiles, and then once he was unconscious, they each gave him a kick so that they would all be in it together and equally guilty. There was another report of a woman crying in the restroom and telling a co-worker that she had witnessed the entire fight and murder. When asked by investigators, however, she said she knew nothing about what had happened. A worker at the paper mill came forward to say that after many months, he had suddenly remembered seeing two men carrying something near the vat that morning Mon Files went missing. He said that what they carried was covered, but that it resembled a body. A different man reported to Winkler that at some point after Monfiles was killed, he was helping Keith Kutzka repair his car. Kutzka accidentally dropped a wrench on the man's head, injuring him. Kutzka then joked that the man had a Monfiles lump on his head. As it turns out, the autopsy report for Monfiles showed that there was a bruise on his head and that he'd suffered a skull fracture. That information had not been released to the public, so Kutzka could only know about Monfiles having been hit in the head if he had been there when it happened. The same man who was fixing the car with Kutzka called investigators one day to tell them that while he was out at a bar with his wife, Kutzka had staged a reenactment on paper of the murder of Tom Monfiles. He claimed that Kutzka drew a diagram showing where five other men had stood and saying what each person had done to Monfiles. Investigators say that there were details during the reenactment that only someone involved in the murder would know. Through these accounts, Winkler and other investigators compiled a list of the the men they believed had been involved in the murder of Tan Monfiles. And on April 12, 1995, six men were arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Two other men were arrested but charged with misdemeanors, including having harassed Monfiles. The men who were arrested included Keith Kutzka, who prosecutors claim set the whole chain of events into motion by playing the tape of Monfiles reporting the theft of wire to the police. Charged with participating in the crime were Michael Hearn, Michael Johnson, Michael Piakowski, wow, Michael was really a popular name back then, Ray Moore, and Dale Bastian. Mike Hearn was said to have pushed Monfiles, and subsequent to the push, Ray Moore was said to have hit Monfiles in the head with a wrench. Once Mon Files was unconscious, the six men made a decision to try and get rid of his body to possibly avoid losing their jobs for having attacked him. The group of charged men began to be known as the Mon Files Six. All of the men pled not guilty to the charges. A jury trial started on September 26, 1995, with all of the men being tried together. The case was too well known to draw a jury from Green Bay, so a jury was brought in from an area quite a ways further south. Brown County District Attorney John Zakowski built his case around the confrontation version of events. With all six men confronting Monfiles, it didn't matter who ultimately killed him because they were all considered guilty under the law. None of the men took a plea deal and none testified against any of the others. Instead, they steadfastly maintained their innocence and each testified that they had not been involved in any murder conspiracy. A little over a month after the trial began, it ended when on October 28, 1995, the jury returned guilty verdicts as to all six of the men. Immediately, the families and friends of the convicted men began efforts to appeal the verdicts and to get the men released from prison. Many raised questions about how the trial had been conducted. Should the men have all been tried together or should they have each had their own trial? Supporters of the men argue that the only way prosecutors were able to get guilty verdicts for all six men was by not treating them as six individuals, but by treating them as one big group. There was some criticism of the education level of the selected jurors. Out of 16 jurors, only one had an education beyond high school. I'm not sure that I think this is a great argument, as you don't need a college education or beyond to understand things. But this was a criticism I found listed in a few different places, so I include it here. 
Perhaps a bigger deal were reports that some jurors fell asleep during parts of the trial. In 2007, one juror came out and seemed to agree with those who thought that trying everyone at once made getting convictions easier by saying, it is too much to process and too easy to just make the same decision for all the defendants. One juror later admitted that she couldn't tell the defendants apart. So did the jurors go back in the jury room and they perhaps thought that Keith Kutzka was guilty of murdering Tom Monfiles, but they then couldn't figure out maybe who else was with him. And so it was just easier to say that all of them did it and that the police must be right and the prosecutors must be right, rather than try to parse out that maybe this guy was there, but maybe this guy wasn't. All the men were saying that they weren't involved and that they weren't there. And the prosecutors had different timelines, but the prosecutors had nobody putting eyewitnesses saying these six men, yes, I watched them beat him up. I watched them put his body in the vat. They just had statements from people. Uh, I saw this person at this time at this part of the mill. And I saw these three men together later on after Mon Files disappeared and they were in this part of the mill and nobody could put them all together. So the jury was really kind of going on just trust in what one of the kind of informants said about, well, Keith Kutzka was at a bar one night and said all these people did this with him. And Keith Kutzka, of course, is like, dude, I was drunk. I was just talking about maybe this is what happened. This is how it could have happened and not meaning that he or anyone else was actually involved. So I could see where the jury would get kind of, you know, you've got six people on trial, you're listening to testimony for four weeks and that at some point you just would be exhausted and be like, hey, okay, guilty as to everyone. But at the same time, I think it's a really serious thing to be convicting people of murder. And so you better be really sure of what you're doing because these men were eventually sentenced to life in prison. So the jury should really have tried to treat each person individually. Back to the whole story. Supporters of the men point to the circumstantial nature of all the evidence and ask, Ask how no forensic evidence was found if Monfiles had really been beaten into unconsciousness. Shouldn't there have been blood spatter found at the mill, or shouldn't some of the men have had bruised and battered hands? As for the autopsy, which showed Monfiles has sustained a skull fracture prior to his death, there are some medical examiners who now claim that there is no way to know if that fracture happened prior to death or not, and that the propeller at the bottom of the vat may have been the cause of the fracture. And there's also the fact that one of the prosecutor's star witnesses, the man who had been at the bar with Kutska when Kutska supposedly confessed to the murder, recanted portions of his testimony. Years after the trial, the man said that he had been pressured and even threatened by a Green Bay police officer. The officer, however, says that he managed to trick the witness into telling his whole story. The biggest argument, perhaps, for the men's innocence may be that even after 25 years, not a single one has admitted to any involvement in Tom Monfile's death. These weren't six really close friends. Sure, the men knew each other because they worked together, but some of the six only knew others by recognizing their faces and didn't even know their names until after their arrests. The argument goes that even mobsters end up ratting each other out when facing life in prison. So if these men really did conspire to kill Tom Monfiles, how did none of them give up the others in exchange for a lighter sentence? But if none of the Monfiles six killed him, who did? There are two theories. One, that Monfiles killed himself, and the other, that another worker at the mill killed him. Co-workers had long suspected Monfiles had some mental health issues. There were incidents of people at the paper mill being arrested for DUIs, and Monfiles would put the news stories on the bulletin board at work. He'd even write his own thoughts about the incidents in the margins of the articles. Another time, a co-worker's baby was born premature, and he made some hurtful comments about it. Some people said that Monfiles Files, who had been a member of the Coast Guard, would tell stories about having to recover dead bodies of people who had committed suicide by drowning. So, is it possible Mon Files decided to drown himself? Was he stressed out about what was going on at the mill and having his co-workers harassing him? Was something else going on in his life? Did he tie the weight around his own neck to prevent himself from panicking and changing his mind? Many people will say that no one would pick that way to kill themselves,
girls, but trust me, if you start to look into it, you will find that people pick all sorts of crazy ways to harm themselves. But if Monfiles didn't kill himself, then is it possible that someone else at the mill killed him? Those who believe the six convicted men are innocent say that police should have looked more closely at paper mill worker David Weiner. Remember the man who said he had a suppressed memory of seeing two men carrying what appeared to be a body near the vat the morning Monfile's body was found? Yeah, that guy was David Weiner. Supporters of the Monfile Six say that unlike the Six, Weiner had a history of fighting and killing someone. Sometime after Monfiles was killed, Weiner got into a fight with his brother and killed him. He was convicted of reckless homicide. None of the Monfile Six had a violent criminal record prior to their murder convictions. But what would Weiner have been fighting with Monfiles about? Could he have been mad about Monfiles for reporting a co-worker for theft, some kind of we all cover for each other mentality. That seems to be going really far unless there was something Monfiles knew about Weiner that he was afraid would come out. From what we've heard about Monfiles though, if he had known something incriminating about Weiner, he would have already told someone that. Police say that Monfiles getting into the vat was more than a one-man job, so Weiner couldn't have done that on his own. The vat was almost chest high and Monfiles would have been dead weight when he went into the vat. Add the heavy weight that was tied around Monfiles' neck and it just just wouldn't be an easy job, if not impossible, for one person. The area where the vat was located was also not large enough for a forklift to fit in. Additionally, the weight that was found around Monfile's neck and the rope used to secure it came from an area away from the vat and near the paper machines. From where Weiner worked in the area of the vat, Weiner would have had to have walked to different paper machines to get the weight and then the rope, and no one ever said they saw him somewhere he wouldn't have normally been that day at work. Okay, so maybe Weiner didn't kill Monfiles. Maybe Weiner made up the story about seeing men with a body near the vat in the hopes of getting a deal that would help him get out of prison for having killed his brother. We just don't know. At this point, five of the Monfiles six have been released from prison. Only Keith Kutska is still incarcerated. Mike Piakowski was the first to be released. In 2001, a federal judge not only granted his petition for a writ of habeas corpus, but also ordered that state prosecutors could not retry him. Getting a habeas petition granted is rare, but having the judge say that you can't be retried is the rarest of rare. It's like winning the habeas petition lottery. Typically, when a judge grants a petition for a writ of habeas corpus, the state is given a certain amount of time in which to decide to retry the person. The judge who granted Piakowski's petition ruled that there was simply not enough evidence for any jury to convict him. That ruling gave hope to the five other men. If one of them was innocent, then the thinking would go that the whole case falls apart because they were convicted as a group. If the police were wrong about Piakowski having been part of the conspiracy, how many more were they wrong about? But one by one, the others' petitions for writs of habeas corpus were denied, and they remained in prison. The next of the Monfile Six to be released was Dale Bastion in 2017. He was released on parole for health reasons and died nine months later. The next year in 2018, Michael Hearn was released on parole and soon after, in 2019, Ray Moore and Michael Johnson were both released on parole. Keith Kutska, who is now 71 years old, was denied parole in March of 2022, but he may be considered again for parole as early as September of 2022. So that's only about a month away. We'll have to check back in. As for the investigator, Randy Winkler, who broke the case wide open, he is confident that the right men were convicted. After the case, he suffered from post-traumatic stress and ended up taking disability retirement. The case had consumed him for a very long time and he felt the effects of that sharply after the trial. In the years since, he has often been vilified by the friends and family of the convicted men. And that brings us all the way up to the present day. There's so much out there on this case, you guys, that I feel like I could go on and on making arguments on both sides of things. I'll leave links to some really great resources down below including a few books that have been written about how the Monfile Six were wrongfully convicted. But we're still left with the question of what happened to Tom Monfiles? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And until next time, stay safe and stay careful.